summer, each putrid grain embedded in sweat. No breeze in the courtyard of Palazzo Ducale, where mother's perfume almost obliterates the Venetian stench. Powdered and scented, we ready for the open air opera. My mother and I, and Mario, poised between us as winds and strings intimate the coming storm and stage lights crash over the grand marble staircase, inaugurating the season of deceit. In the dark, Mario's expert fingers forage in the folds of mother's skirt. Symbols and drums confirm it all. We follow the Moor who in his innocence believes himself a cuckold but is not, while my absent father, in his innocence, trusts and is betrayed. I am evil because I am man, sings Iago that summer night in 1965, the Istrian stone gleaming pure under the stars. Dio crudel, keep me silent. To Iago's God, I pray. Keep father safe in Sumatra with no one to lead him to the Venetian light. I'm sure most people have ambivalent feelings about where they, the places they love, and, and I adore Venice, we keep coming back. But yes, it's love and hate. I mean, there are these things that are repulsive, you know, and one encounters them without any, um, Barriers because you're always exposed to Venice, you're walking everywhere. You know, we have a, a fortunately a septic life, you know, in the United States. I mean, we, we get out of our clean houses and we go into our clean cars and we go to our clean air conditioned offices or the mall. I mean, it's most people don't encounter rodents right. in their life. Anyway, not that they're all over Venice, this was a very isolated event, but uh, it did seem mm -hmm. there was a lot of artifice in Venice, mm -hmm. and uh, it seemed a poignant moment. I can't claim a kind of cosmopolitan connection to Venice, but uh, I'm a country boy. I grew up in Concord, Massachusetts, as I told both our friends here. I used to skinny dip in high school in Walden Pond, where Thoreau lived for a while, so I guess I come by my American transcendental uh, <laughs> compulsions, honestly, or at least wetly, I don't know quite. Um, but one of the fascinations I have, because I'm from the country, is the city. And uh, I've spent uh, days recently in your city with great pleasure, of course, uh, returning here for the second time. And in my first book, uh, Arcade, I was following the lead, I often write ekphrastic poetry, poetry suggested by other art and describing other art. Um, Franz Maus Real was a Belgian woodcut artist who, between the wars, documented in rather primitive but very affecting um, woodcuts that he printed in small books the, the cities of, of Europe between the wars, which fascinated me at a given time. And I wrote a sequence of poems based on those woodcuts, so I think I'll start by reading one of those, um, not set here, but set in the city, and um, therefore the subject of, of my fascination with cities. This is called The City from a Field. He is looking at the city from a field, the flowers at his back, elaborate symbols of some spurned reality, pinwheel semaphores, all petal and pistol, the ghosts of spiked streetlights now sealed and invisible in the urban tantric, and this misremembered daylight. Only from this vantage, call it the past, does the street's multiform argument yield its false logic. Can the dialogue of smokestack and steeple sound audibly? Do you hear the singing of the distant revenants? See their somnambulant circuits, their roots buried like the tunnels of ants. Their only meted fate is irreality. As seen from here, the men of reason pass unseeing the men of spirit in the boulevards, a warmth moving through a coolness. Even in the bustling streets and railway yards, these walkers disappear in a spell of edges, and the rapt geometries of the perfect planes 
of sun gilt facades, the unbroken phalanx of tall windows adamantine, beautiful as this field's thwarted blue flocks. Even the architecture's run of miles wane in the distance as perspective collapses on its way to the unalterable, unreachable apex, and the biggest building on the block turns vaporous, a proof against its marble fact. At this remove, the city as it is, and will remain, disappears. I think, I think for me, as I said, the, the city as a, as a habitat is alien to me. So part of the charge of both being in cities, at least at the time I was writing this sequence, being in, in large cities outside of America was very new to me. Um, that, that sense of, of feeling them to be alien and somehow inimical to what I actually understood um, about myself and how I operated in the world was, was kind of thrilling, I suppose. Um, so I hope that the sequence as a whole strikes very many different moods about being in a city. Some are, are quite light and some are quite dark. Um, and I think that the city provides a kind of um, template against which one's consciousness can play in all sorts of ways. And I think that's what I find so exciting about it. Um, well, as I said before, is it a kind of boys experience into a city? Partly. Partly. Though I'm trying to be quite urbane and sophisticated <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm writing about the city. I don't know if it comes off that way. But, um, uh, it's also, of course, the lore of artifice, the fact that um, we're in a place that's not defined by nature, but by what's man-made, human-made, and, uh, and, and I find myself drawn to that even as I'm perhaps more comfortable outside of it at the same time. So um, the city as a subject was one that fascinated me for a long time. It's also the case that I was traveling a lot during the years that I, I wrote that sequence, so I was spending time in new places. and. As, as I have been here, just suspending your daily life to walk the streets of a new city, I think, can be a fascinating and altering um, way to conceal the self, to let go. I mean, for instance, I'm not taking my children to uh, lacrosse practice this week at home. Well, lacrosse is not a word I should use to public sports <laughs> practice. Um, um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not worrying about um, what time my wife needs to be at the studio. I'm just worrying about my pleasure and, and walking and seeing things. I feel that that, so the city represents in part for me that kind of escape from my normal consciousness, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That helps, I don't think that's an answer, but that's my attempt. You know, I'm, I'm very much intrigued by the threshold between writing for the page and writing for a song. And we know that, for example, many of Leonard Cohen's songs started as poems, which were, you know, the music was put on top of it. And we were talking before about Eric Anderson famous songwriter from New York. I mean, many of his songs started as poems. He didn't even realize that they were songs. And someone suggested to him, this is beautiful lyric for a song. Why don't you put some music on top of it? So, do, you, do we know what, where the threshold is? Yeah. And what the threshold is? <laughs> do you think of them as continuous? Poetry and, and lyric? I don't know. We had a very good example here a few weeks ago with Gertha Stevenson. Uh, she performed brilliantly both her poems and her songs, and sometimes they were quite the same. You know, that beautiful combination of styles and genres, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and if you, if you listen together, you know, you, <laughs> you have to adjust all the uh, thoughts you have you know, about poetry and songs. I write songs as well as an amateur, I'm not at all a professional songwriter or performer. Um, but I, I think I know almost always whether I'm writing a lyric to a song or if I'm writing a lyric to a poem, that I'm mm -hmm. writing a poem. I don't, I don't, there's very, I can't think of any time for those for me and crossed over that I've written something I'm thinking of as a poem for the page. And I think, ah, oh, that would be good to set. I, I'm sort of either writing a song or I'm writing a poem. And I don't know if that distinction, creating that strong threshold, is peculiar to me, um, or if it's something that someday I'll end up mixing. Um, this is a, a very different poem called Don't Tell It to Go Away. It's a poem about um, being married a long time. I think. Don't tell it to go away. 
There's a ghost in the room. Call it us. If we court it, it will not stay. If we fail to court it, it will not stay. But it is here now, so we name it. You and I. In the empty world, we warm with these old words. Your sleep talk, incomprehensible. And my simple, unanswered questions. I lie along the length of your body, an old habit reacquired. In contact, we remake this visitor together, forged like a long-handled fork to help sate a hunger, or a pure-hulled frigate meant for freighting what we knew and know again.
internalize that in many ways as a poet myself. But it's uh, when I read contemporary American poets, he's one I like to turn to because I think he's got something right and he's doing a very good thing. I just wanted to add one more that's important, really important uh, to both of us, and that's Richard Howard. Of course. And I think you, you, you published him in that anthology. And you were talking about masks earlier and so on. He is, he is really our Browning. Um, he's, he's the one. And so even when he talked about you being external, he meant that as the highest compliment because it was what he is. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was being a little too flip about that. He is, he is someone who I would say is. Yeah, so you know, he's always picking up persona and that's his strength. And, uh, and for him, the, the highest compliment to say, boy, you are a person who uses masks all the time. My first book, he gave me a blurb, and he said, your big voice is a vampire. <laughs> is that a reason, the reason why you have the mask?